Hey everyone, it's Ron Johnson, and this is the Ron Johnson Show on the Locked On Sports Minnesota Podcast Network. Today's show, we're going to dive into, of course, roll the boat. Why not? Michigan State took the L to Minnesota. Minnesota dominated Michigan as a whole. The Vikings beat the Lions. Minnesota beat Michigan State. So we have to talk about that Michigan State game, though. Coming up later, also, we have Mike Lehan, former Gopher NFL DB, joining the show. I'm going to tell you why everybody thought Mel Tucker had it together and that P.J. Fleck was kind of right at the same level. I'm going to explain why P.J. Fleck has now surpassed and become one of the top five coaches in, the, in, in, the, uh, in college football. Stay tuned. On the field, in the broadcast booth, Ron Johnson is Minnesota sports. One of a kind opinions, big name guests, the teams you care about every, every, every day. It's the Ron Johnson Show, part of Locked On Sports Minnesota, and it starts now. Welcome to the Ron Johnson Show. I'm your host, Ron Johnson, and this is the Locked On Sports Minnesota Podcast Network. On today's show, as I said, we have to talk about Minnesota and Michigan State. But Mo Ibrahim was the star of the show. Uh, Jalen Berger tried to do, Berger tried to do whatever he could do to keep up, but Minnesota is a lot better than people are giving them credit for. Chris Hoffman Bell goes down, and even I questioned who would step up. Well, we know who stepped up. We'll talk about him a little bit later as well. But before we jump into this show, and I bring Sam Extraman, my producer, make sure you subscribe to Locked On Sports Minnesota for endless Vikings talk during the football season. Not only can you find us on YouTube or your favorite podcasting platform, but we are now on Roku and Amazon Fire with the all-new Locked On Sports Minnesota app. Check it out today for all your favorite shows. Well, as I bring my producer in, Sam Ekstrom, Sam, it's my Tuesday take. And my Tuesday take is that P.J. Fleck is for sure one of the top 10 coaches in college football. In my opinion, right now, he's trending in a top five trajectory. If you look at their possible record, the Gophers' biggest like issues. Now, don't overlook Illinois because Brett Bielema has these guys playing, and we know Minnesota and Brett Bielema, you know, have always had trouble. But Illinois is playing well. But you look at Penn State on paper, that's one. You look at Wisconsin on paper, that's two because of Braylon Oliver. Nothing against Iowa. I just feel like they haven't figured it out yet, but it's a long season. I'd rather play. I, honestly, I wish they went back to the days where we play Iowa a little earlier sometimes because I would like to get Iowa, like, right now. If we get Iowa right now, it looks just like the Michigan State game. It's a blowout. There's no question marks. Smoking cigars by halftime. Uh, you know, uh, the, the freshmen are getting a chance to play. It's, it's, it is what it is. But later in the season, Kirk Ferentz, Brian Ferentz, they might get it together and figure this offense out. But, Sam, this is my question for you on my Tuesday take. Mm -hmm. When Minnesota, because if they play Penn State and they beat them, and then you look at Iowa, Wisconsin, and they find a way to go undefeated in the West. They don't play Ohio State, though, and they don't play Michigan. Yep. How far can the Gophers be ranked? Like, how high can they go undefeated in the Big Ten but not playing Ohio State and Michigan until the Big Ten Championship? How high do you think they can get? I think you certainly move up into the top ten, and you probably get right into that zone where people are talking about you on the fringes of the college football playoff. But then there's going to be the argument, well, the Gophers haven't played anybody until Ohio State. So then you'll have to beat Ohio State probably to be that fourth team in the college football playoff. I would guess. I, I think most of the time, if you're a college or a, a Power 5 college football team and you're undefeated, you're probably going to be in the playoff. So I think the Gophers would be in that top four if they got to that point. Um, it's, it's going to be tough. Those road games are going to be hard. Wisconsin and Penn State are not going to be easy at all. Um, but to go on the road at Michigan State in front of a big crowd, I mean, that, that crowd was jacked up. That team had every reason to be jacked up. And the Gophers made them look like Colorado. They made them look like New Mexico State. Um, so I think they can be a top five team by the end of the season with at least a hope of being in that college football playoff mix. Long way to get there, though, Ron. We're one conference game in. But I think that's what would happen if these wins kept coming. And, and this is where I go with this P.J. Fleck top 10, top 5. Kirk Herbstreet uh, tweeted out his top four or his top week four performers. P.J. Mm -hmm. Fleck is in this list. 
um, you know, Oregon's coaches in this list, the Vols coach, KU, uh, Notre Dame's uh, OC, and Chris Kleiman at uh, K-State as well. So when you think about K-State beating Oklahoma, Minnesota beating Michigan State, this is the one thing I look at all those list of coaches. P.J. Fleck has always been trending in this direction. These guys, I think, are like, hey, just had a good week. They jumped in there. But P.J.'s been trending. If you were to look at, like, the top coaches right now in college football, honestly, you, you, you secretly always have to say Nick Saban. He's been quiet this year. You know, Alabama hasn't had their big test yet. Uh, you, you have to look at Lincoln Riley, what he's doing. And then when you start to go through the rest, you got Ohio State's coach. Yep, Ryan Day is doing a good job. Uh, great coach there. And then you're kind of like, well, who else is out there? Like, who else can we throw in this list of top five, top ten coaches? It's P.J. Fleck. Like, P.J. Fleck has taken the world by storm. He's slowly created a, a small, uh, dominant force with this run game in Minnesota. These offensive linemen are, are, are loving coming back and playing for this type of offensive line. I mean, they're gelling quick. You, you bought in a bunch of guys. You just did not know what you were going to get out of this guy, out of these guys, and they're working well together. Like, they are moving the pile. Mo Ibram. And it could be, is it Mo or is it them? You know, like, that's that's always the question mm -hmm. mark. But I, I'll put this. Every great back can be only as good as a semblance of their offensive line. If their offensive line is trash, I don't care who it is. It's going to be tough. Unless you're Barry Sanders and you're just running away from people and not hitting the hole. Yeah, but Mo is hitting the hole because there's holes there. Like a, a lesser running back probably doesn't get what Mo's getting out of it, and a lesser offensive line probably slows Mo Mo down a little bit because if there's eight guys in the box and, and everybody's like got a gap, there's nowhere to go. Uh, we've seen that. We've seen Ohio State. Uh, Mo was handling them, but Ohio State was doing their thing too. Like it, it was not what we saw against these past couple teams. Uh, the competition hasn't been there. Not sure Purdue is going to put up a, as big of a fight either. Um, and so, again, it, it, it comes down to one of those things. Don't overlook your opponent. And that's where I go with this. Like, Minnesota is going to be favored in most of these upcoming games until probably Penn State. And so you can't overlook your foe. Like, you can't overlook the team because then a Bowling Green. Mm -hmm. And I think Bowling Green last year was the best thing that may have happened to this year's team because you, you know now I can't overlook anybody. Like, we're good. But any given Saturday, if somebody gets hot, it's over. Look at K-State and Oklahoma. I'm pretty sure Oklahoma probably overlooked them just a little bit. Uh, Martinez, everybody talked about he's not a good quarterback. Well, he had a day. He had one day. He looked pretty good. Other than that, I have sources at K-State that say he's still the guy he was in Nebraska. He's not that good. But he had a good day. And I think that's all that matters. And that's what you. that's what college football is all about. App State, you see Appalachian State, what they've been doing. Like, you just never know, and that's why you play to the whistle. But the Gophers right now are really good. P.J. Flex doing well. You think about Mo Ibram. Daniel Jackson, so that's the other one I'm going to go with. My other Tuesday take is Daniel Jackson came out of nowhere. Like, he had a great game. He helped out Tanner Morgan. But Chris Altman Bell being down, Daniel Jackson mm -hmm. said, I'll stand up. I said it should be Daylon Wright, Daniel Jackson, or Michael Brown Stevens. Well, it was Daniel Jackson's week. Now, we will see, because I think he threw it to like 10 different receivers. So we will see what that looks like against Purdue. Is it going to be a Daniel Jackson show? Because now, not say it's a bunch of faceless names, but a lot of people couldn't point, point these receivers out in the lineup with like all just the receivers, like figuring out who each one is. I mean, I could because I've interviewed these guys, but a lot of people don't know who these guys are. So is Purdue even thinking we have to stop Daniel Jackson or we have to stop you know, Michael Brown, Stevens, or Dalen Wright. They're just lining up and playing. So I think that's another benefit. Like, there's not a guy out there. There's not a, you know, a, a, a Rashad Bateman or, or a Tyler Johnson or Eric Decker. Like, there's not a guy out there right now because Chris Alman Bell got hurt. So now a guy has to stand up and become a guy. And teams don't just line up and say, okay, I'm going to stop this guy. It reminds me a little bit of Wisconsin a while back when they're, they didn't have a true number one receiver. You know, Quintez Cephas was okay, but it wasn't like a true – number one and so teams really couldn't figure out who to stop and that's where these gophers receivers are right now that's where this gophers offense is right now which is good for them mo ibrahim is the guy everybody knows we got to stop the run but it's hard to stop the run when the offensive line is that good but again never overlook your opponents uh never overlook the next guy up on this list that's why pj fleck constantly says this is the one and oh or the zero zero purdue championship season he doesn't want the guys looking to penn state even though we all have done that we're already to Penn State. Now, we're saying the sneaky Illinois game, but we've all moved on. Like, bring on Penn State. Bring this wide out on. Like, let's go. Let's see what they can do. 
you know, college game day is going to find the Gophers at some point this year, I feel like, if they continue on this trend, whether it is the Penn State game, whether it is the uh, Wisconsin or Iowa game, college game day is going to find P.J. Fleck and these Gophers because they're going to probably be undefeated for a while. Now, again, things could change. College football changes in a, in a blip. Injuries happen. But I think this is a really good team, a really solid team. And uh, I, I, I do think if they can – I don't know if they can beat Ohio State in the championship. But, again, by that time in the season, it's anybody's game. And with C.J. Stroud, the goal is keep him in front of you. Make him slowly go down the field. Make him go 19, 18 plays. They've been kick, quick striking, killing people. you got to see what happens if you slow him down and just say, I'm going to keep you in front of me. You might complete a couple, but you're going to have to complete 18 passes to beat us on a drive. And and I don't I haven't seen the team do that yet. I don't know how easy that is. I you know, I'm not a defensive coordinator, but Sam, before we jump into uh the Mike Lehan uh segment as he hangs with, with that's my boy. I mean, we were freshmen together. We were in the same dorm together. Have a lot of stories together. Uh still been really good friends. Uh, our friend group stayed together uh all the way up until now. I mean, we're 42 years old. Uh he's a Hall of Famer as well at Hopkins High School Hall of Fame. But before we do that, we have a word from our sponsors. BetOnline.net continues to be your number one source for online wagering info. BetOnline.net tells you that the Gophers are 10.5-point favorites against Purdue Saturday at 11 a.m., over under 53. You can get that and plenty more at BetOnline.net. It's NCAA football lines. It's NFL lines. MMA, boxing, and golf as well, plus the end of the MLB season. It's your number one source for sports wagering information. BetOnline.net. Use your mobile device to learn more. BetOnline, where the game starts. Well, it's time for the Ron Johnson segment. Hanging with Ron Johnson and my boy Mike Lehan. Mike Lehan and I came in in New York, Minnesota together in 1998. Uh, we, were, we were down the hall from each other back in Sanford Hall, uh, him, myself, Aston Osai, Jermaine Mays, and Jeremiah Carter, who people might not know who that is, but look him up, Google him. He is the compliance officer now for the University of Minnesota. He was my roommate our freshman year. Uh, had a ton of fun. You had Marlon Cooper from Detroit also was with Mike. A um, lot of stories, some I can't even tell on this podcast, but Mike Lehan is also not only a Hopkins Hall of Fame, so we know Hopkins sports is huge in Minnesota, basketball, football, uh, baseball, but also Mike Lehan was drafted into the NFL, played with the Dolphins, the Browns. We'll talk a little bit about that. And he's a hometown kid that ended up going to Minnesota, so we have to jump into that. But, Mike, man, I want to pre I appreciate you joining me on the Ron Johnson Show. Uh, I'm going to jump out there and throw this out to you. Uh, you see now P.J. Fleck getting around Minnesota trying to recruit. You see a kid like Quinn Carroll from Edina go to Notre Dame, not really have any success at Notre Dame. Learned a lot, he said, but, you know, not, not a successful – Offensive lineman career there comes to Minnesota now, start and tackle. Everybody's talking about how good he is. Uh, what are the benefits? And, and you see the same thing with Dawson Garcia in basketball. Went to Marquette, okay. Went to Notre Dame or uh, North Carolina. Didn't play much. Now with Minnesota, he's going to be the guy. He's the guy in the Big Ten, six eleven swing. Uh, what, what what do you? What is it? Or what was for you? Why you chose to stay uh, home in Minnesota? See, I think it's interesting, and I, I appreciate that it's changed over time. So initially that uh, back in my time, 1998, when we came into the U, there wasn't a lot of respect around the speed, the strengths, the size, particularly in the skill positions. And so naturally it was division two, naturally it was out of state somewhere else. Now all of a sudden that PJ Flex is really kind of investing into the hometown talent, even people that most recently going to quarterback going to Wisconsin or something like that. So I think the fact that PJ Fleck is really investing in the hometown talent acknowledging it, knowing that it's there is critically important. And so for me, it was just really remarkable to be able to come home. And that was, truth be told, that was the only D1 offer that I had uh, going in uh, to college. So it was a natural decision for me to stay home and have that opportunity. Yeah, and you started off as a running back. Like I remember uh, freshman camp, we came in for training camp and, and you were out there uh, fast, you know, give you a toss sweep, you're up the sideline. And then all of a sudden, I look over and, and 39 is at DB. And I'm like, man, I got to deal with this dude now. Um, what was that switch like being a running back your most of your life? And then all of a sudden, you know, Glenn Mason says, or whoever, David Gibbs maybe, uh, says, hey, you'd probably be a better DB. You know, that was, a, that was a change. I came in, but I'll tell you what, once I came in and saw the size of folks when I was a running back, I'm coming in there 170 pounds dripping wet. Uh, Tellus Redmond and I, 
Renato Fitzpatrick, uh, you know, some of the talent that we had right there in that uh, backfield as well. So it was uh, it was a great choice. You know, David Gibbs would always tell me, OK, I'm going to make you a DB even my in my uh, redshirt freshman year. So it was a, it was a challenging uh, transition. But naturally, at that point, I had a little bit of speed. So it gave me some time to work and refine my technique a little bit. But that's when you have to trust in the coaches. And I think that's one thing that uh, when you have good coaches, much of like what we're seeing at the University of Minnesota right now, they're bringing in skilled, talented individuals. And it's on them as coaches to make sure that they're refining and honing their craft so that they can become top-notch players and have uh, the success that they're having. And so the fact that David Gibbs saw an opportunity in me, that he invested time and energy to coach me and refine those skills. And ultimately, it was a good choice. You know, got six years out of that at the next level. And look at the Dolphins. I mean, the, the Vikings are going to clash with the Dolphins soon enough. Uh, when you were with the Dolphins, it was kind of an up and down type of team. Uh, as the years have gone on, they become a joke. And now they're back. Like, it, it feels like a little Dan Marino-ish when you look at some of the offensive plays they're running. You got Tua. You got uh, uh, Tyreek Hill. Uh, you got, uh, what's his name, Jalen Waddle. And now, you know, and, and the coach has gotten these guys, so far at least, playing well. Uh, they beat, you know, everybody's Super Bowl favorite, which is the Buffalo Bills. They found a way to beat them. So when you think about this, man, with the Miami Dolphins, uh, what what is it about Miami that, you know, for a while, which it seems like a great place for free agents. I mean, it's Miami. What what do you think it took for, for guys to get back to where they're at now? Really, I, I think it's just a creativity. Creativity. There's a, the fan base uh, in Miami is remarkable. I mean, obviously, it's, it wasn't that long ago. It, it really was, but it doesn't for folks that have been in, in South Florida for a while. It wasn't that long ago that they remembered uh, Dan Marino. They remember, you know, undefeated teams and so forth. They've always had talent, and now it's just refining that talent. Even when I was playing on there, we had, you know, Jason Taylor, uh, mm -hmm. Thomas as a linebacker, Channing Crowder. We had, you know, just a stacked team. Chad Pennington, we had Dante Culpepper. We had a lot of talented individuals. Uh, you know, everything just didn't click and didn't come together. So now the fact uh, that it is coming together and they're seeing some, uh, you know, in drafting, and they've done a really good free agency as well as far as uh, getting some draft picks, trading off some people, trading, getting some people. So they've really developed a really good team. And now all of a sudden they got a coach that's creative, that's young, that has some grit. Uh, and you're seeing the same thing for the go for the Vikings as well. So uh, it, you know it's it's fun to see them win. Uh, obviously, as a hometown guy, I want to see the Vikings win, uh, even though I played for Miami. But uh, just exciting to see some talent come around and and see some success. Yeah, you're you're athletic director at IMG Academy down in Bray Bradenton, Florida, uh, and so you you deal with that. You deal with um, you know high or wait, no, you're not the AD. Are you? The, you're the president, right? Or what is your role? Yeah, senior vice president of academics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah, you're the man down there. But you know, you guys are you guys are engaged in like hiring talent to mold the kids, to to collaborate, uh, to to be innovative, to be to to think outside the box. I mean, when you think about an academy like that of sports, and you have to tie in the academics, that's probably why you were bought in to make sure the academic side isn't falling off. Uh, you have to be. Uh, a, a collaborator. And so when you hear terms like that with the Vikings and Kevin O'Connell, you're a hometown kid. Uh, when Kevin O'Connell bought, was bought in, it was that. He was collaborative. Uh, he was very open. He was a player's coach. Um, every player after the loss said, man, it was great to, to not be MF'd and cursed out and degraded. It felt good to have a coach stand in the trenches with us. And then they we returned the favor and beat the Lions. Uh, how important is it to have a collaborative coach running your program? So I think about a collaborative coach, uh, but then I also think about uh, somebody who understands that they don't have all the answers. And mm -hmm. oftentimes with these big contracts that some of the coaches are having, they, they feel like, you know, I, I just need to come in and tell people what to do rather than coming alongside people, being able to understand the, the inherent talents that people bring to the table and the multiple perspectives that people have as well. So obviously to be a leader, it's, it's listening first and, and understanding the context in which you're operating in. And I think that's really what we're seeing from O'Connell is coming in and understanding the context, understanding what is the skill, uh, the talent that's on the team, and then asking questions, how can I best position you uh, to, to be successful? And that's really what a smart coach does is to be able to understand the slate, the roster, and position them best within their skill set 
for success. And uh, I think that's just critical rather than coming in on their agenda and saying, hey, this is the offense, this is the defense, this is the special teams that I run. I'm not going to sway or divert from that at all. This is what we're going to do. Well, let's see and let's work with the, with the um, roster that we have. One of the things that Coach Saban used to always say at uh, when I was in Miami with him is that he always wanted to hire people smarter than he was. Now, there's not a lot of people probably in college football who's smarter than what Nick Saban is. But the point being is that he wanted to make sure that that talented coaches were also on the roster so that they could also be able to see and then extrapolate the very best talent out of the people around. Yeah, and as a former NFL cornerback, you look at Justin Jefferson, uh, you look at Adam Thielen, two of the best in the NFL. Justin Jefferson considered, you know, top two in the NFL receivers. Um, on a weekly basis, what would you mentally do to try to slow down or stop a Justin Jefferson if you knew you had to deal with him in the upcoming week? I think it has everything to do with just making sure that you know where your where your support is. Like where where can you funnel? What what uh, plays can you jump and and what plays can you take a little bit more risk on? At the end of the day, it's not going to be getting. It's not a head game. It's more about just making sure that you're technically sound, knowing what the offense usually tries to do on the down and distance and so forth, and then obviously know where your help is. Uh, it's and that's you know critical to understand your position. When you understand your position, you know that. Because honestly, and Ron, you know this so well. I remember even when we were playing against the other, you were with the Bears, and I was with the Browns at that time in our preseason game. Uh, and just knowing that there is, you know, there's just so much going on in the game and understanding um, how fast the game is, but then knowing mm -hmm. how critical where the support is and so forth. You can never, uh, uh, and then because technique, you can't hardly touch anybody nowadays without getting a, right. a flag or a penalty or anything like that. So it's really about being proximal and trying to make a play on the ball to the best you can. Yeah, and, and last one before we get out of this um, and go into the daily three. When you look at PJ Fleck, you know, another, you know, considered top coach, uh, some people love him, some people hate him. Uh, when you think about row the boat and just, you know, putting your head down, rowing, let, letting the coach lead you, um, all that kind of stuff. Like w when you think about PJ Fleck is now your head coach with Minnesota, um, you know, what are your thoughts on, on what he's done so far with the team? I think it's great. I, I think that um, we, he's a generational coach in a sense that um, he understands the motivating factors of his players. He understands what's going to get them to come show up and show out on a daily basis. And that's a skill set that's as critically important as the X and O's to the extent in which they understand, um, you know, what what are the motive, what is the intrinsic and extrinsic motivators of the people that I have. And so as I think about PJ Fleck, the fact that he just comes with energy, that he's going to coach you 100 percent of the time you come off the field, he's going to coach you right. He's going to get you better. That He has that energy that it's 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 not. Um, uh, smoke and mirrors. It's not disingenuous. It's one that, l listen, I love football. I love playing this game. I love competing. Let's go out and compete. Because at the daily basis, I have to understand uh, or believe that in the meetings, it's that same energy. He's competing against the coaches on the other sideline. He wants to win. And when you know that your coach wants to win and he's not just there collecting a paycheck, you know, I'm going to feel different. And, and I think that's what you're seeing is people that are willing to to run through walls and so on and so forth because they believe in what they're seeing and hearing from him. Yeah, man. Well, appreciate that. That'll do it for uh, the Hang of Ron Johnson segment. But you know what? We got Sam Ekstrom. He's going to join us on the show. We're going to jump into this daily three. That's three questions, uh, three minutes each. That's going to be a minute and 30 for me. Maybe Mike could take two. I'll take a minute. But you know, you know how we do. But before we jump into the daily three, do you want instant post game reaction from the insiders that cover your favorite teams? Check out our Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast on YouTube. Follow every Twins, Vikings, Wild, or Wolves game. Our Locked On team hosts are broadcasting live with team insiders. Never miss a podcast by subscribing to the Locked On Sports Minnesota YouTube channel. Well, take it away, Sam. All right, I've got a Gophers question for you both to kick things off. I'm looking back to that 2019 Gophers team. They went 11-2. and They beat Auburn in a bowl game. Uh, they beat Penn State, who was top 10 at the time. Could this Gophers team be better than the 2019 Gophers team that went 11-2? and I'll let Ron Johnson take the first crack at it. Uh, I'm going to say no. I'm going to say from a record standpoint, maybe. 
Um, I personally just feel like that 2019 team, when you look at Rashad Bateman, you look at Tyler Johnson, uh, same quarterback in Tanner Morgan. You got Kurt Sharaka back, same, you know, OC, same head coach. No, from an overall standpoint, I mean, now Mo Iberman running back does cancel out the fact that he wasn't playing or uh, no, he was playing then. So uh, you, you got to mm. look at the Mo Ibram running back situation now versus the running backs then. Uh, I, I just, and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm biased. I just got to look at that, that big three, you know, you got Chris Hoffman, Bell, Rashad Bateman, Tyler Johnson. I feel like that group, uh, under the right circumstances, any given Saturday could have beat any team that year. Uh, this team hasn't been tested yet. So again, it, it, this is one of those years where just beat the teams you're supposed to beat. And Mason would always say split with the hard ones. Um, I don't, I don't even think they will split with the hard ones. I think they're going to probably knock off. Wisconsin and Iowa maybe lose to Penn State and go, you know, 11 and one up into the Big Ten championship game. Uh, but no, I don't think they're bad. I think it was more talent from a receiver standpoint on that previous team. And that's the only way I'm going with it. I'm biased there. Uh, from a linebacker standpoint, you know, you had Carter Coughlin, Kamal Martin. Uh, so we don't really know what Mariana Sori Marin is going to be and Thomas Rush. Uh, still got to see that. But no, I'm, I'm going to say 2019, in my opinion, seemed like more talented team. What do you think, Mike? Well, you know, being a B, uh, DB, I would never usually agree with a wide receiver, but in this uh, <laughs> scenario, I, I absolutely agree with Ron. I think that what tips the scales uh, ever so slightly is just the depth that they had at wide receiver in 2019. And I think that uh, it gives you, a, you know, spread it out when you have that depth there, spread out the offense, and then you, you know, hand off the ball, they're just going to, you know, they're going to run. So uh, I, I would agree 2019, I think, had a really stacked roster. Sam, what do you think? Because you, you're the one throwing the question out. Yeah, you know, I look at this defense, and it is hard to say because we don't know how good Michigan State really was, and they didn't play anybody in the non-conference. So it's hard to say. But you remember that 2019 team, Ron? They struggled with South Dakota State, Fresno State, and Georgia Southern in the non-conference. This team had no issue with some non-conference teams. So I do think that they're true, maybe true. ahead of the trajectory already. But they did beat an Auburn team, team, though, then. 2019, they beat an Auburn SEC top yeah, team. So I think true. it took them time to get going. Um, and, and if I'm not mistaken, I think that was the year Joe Rossi finally took over eventually. I think their defense struggled in 19 and Rossi took over. Pretty sure that was that year. I have to go back and look. They definitely got better as that year went on, for sure. Yeah. And we'll see if this team can do the same. All right, next question. I want to hear some stories from you guys. All right, uh, Mike, I want you to think back to maybe a wide receiver that you faced in your college career. Ron, I want you to think about a defensive back you faced. Think about someone who went on to have a big NFL career. How did, who was it? How did you do against them in that situation? What do you remember from facing some of the best college football players? Ron, you can go first. Man, I... I mean, I don't know if I would call it illustrious, um, but I mean, my, 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 my days of like going against a DB, my, my funnest one still is going to be Ohio State. I mean, but Mike Doss had a good career. Nate Clemens was a first round pick. Uh, but Antoine Winfield Sr., I'll never forget playing against him uh, in college my freshman year. I started at receiver, walking into the horseshoe. I visited Ohio State in high school. Uh, so I saw Eddie George going up against Washington. Um, so I was able to see how big, you know, Terry Glenn and all these guys were. And then I get to college and I had grown by the time I, you know, I grew like a couple inches that summer, but, you know, going into the horseshoe, seeing that crowd, my freshman year playing against Antoine Winfield, I'd say I learned the most because as a freshman, I learned very fast that there are some DBs that can hit you just as hard as linebackers. Antoine Winfield senior was not afraid to tackle. He was not afraid to put his helmet in your back. Um, he, he was always in position, you know, we couldn't double move him. Uh, he was very savvy where, uh, Nate Clemens was really good, but I think he let the moment get like, he wanted every ball. Like he jumped every single route, uh, where Antoine Winfield, like, I don't think he looked at Minnesota as a threat. So he was back there chilling, playing off coverage, uh, and he was breaking on everything. Uh, so I'd say those two for me. Uh, from one, you know, the, the big game against Ohio State, but then Antoine Winfield Sr. just learning, like, man, I got to do a lot more than just run a route. Like, I got to figure out where this guy's leverage is. I got to figure out where he's trying to force me to. Uh, if it's cover two, I got to make sure I stay on the sideline because these safeties are coming. Um, I learned a ton from that Ohio State game my freshman year. Mike? 
So I think about um, Lee Evans, Wisconsin, uh, definitely talented. I know he went off to the Bills and had uh, you know pretty good. Had an injury, though, so didn't get a chance to play with him, against him a lot in college when he was at Wisconsin. But certainly a talented. I think about Rambo uh, at Ohio State again, really talented. And then Charles Johnson, Michigan State as well. Uh, I was injured for one of the games, but had a chance to play against him. Now maybe didn't go off to have. Uh, you know, I, get, I think probably Lee Evans probably had the most illustrious career potentially at the at the NFL level, but really great uh, college players. I know that uh, I always look forward to it, and it was it was a good test. And Ron always got me ready in practice as well, so that was good. I know those battles can be fierce with the DBs and the wide receivers. Were you guys trash talkers at all? I wasn't not and, and Mike was my friend like we were we were came in together like him me him Aston Tony Patterson uh we all hung out together in college like me and Mike like I remember there was a story of, like I don't know if Mike was a part of it but me and a couple guys dressed up like ninjas and like terrorized our dorm one year <laughs> like Greg White like we hit him in the head with oranges he was so pissed off um but no I never talked to Mike the only people I think I talked to in practice were like the people that were annoying so, like Eli Ward uh, Renato Fitzpatrick, like they would just talk. So I had to like talk back to them. Uh, but yeah, it is practice. I'm just trying to get through it to get to the week. Like I'm trying not to get hurt. Like Willie, Middle Willie Middlebrooks didn't talk much. Delvin Jones did. Uh, so the only time I would really talk is the talkers. Like Mike was a silent, like assassin. He didn't say much. Well, I want to know more about that in the final daily three question. I want both of your own opinions in practice. Who won more of the battles between you two guys? Ron, let's get your perspective first. I don't know if I'm concussed, but I don't remember. Like, I honestly don't remember. Because, I, like I said, Mike was so quiet. Like, he was a silent assassin. And then, like, my first couple years, I went up against, like, Jimmy Wyrick, Willie Middlebrooks. I don't think I started dealing with Mike until, like, my junior, senior year. Uh, but by then, like, I wasn't practicing on Mondays because I had class. Uh, so it was just, a, it was different then. Like we didn't like one-on-ones, I'd have to go back and watch tape probably. But like mm -hmm. I said, like Mike, like if a guy was talking and, and John, I would remember, but Mike literally never said anything. Like, I don't think I could get a peep out of Mike. Like you could beat Mike on a deep ball or he could bat the ball down. The only thing he's going to do is kind of run off with his speed and kind of give you the finger wag, but he's not saying much. Um, so it was kind of hard to like get, get a lot out of him. Like, cause he wouldn't say anything. Like he was so quiet. Uh, like I, I'd, I'd see him in games we played, he would be out there, you know, making plays and saying stuff. But in practice, he rarely said much. Like, I think we all were just trying to get through it. Cause this, that was the real days of practice where we actually hit on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, two a days, we actually tackled to the ground. Like we banged two practices. Like it was, it was such a different, like even in the NFL, I remember like Chris McAllister, Gary Bax, like we were just trying to get through practices like there wasn't time unless there was a fight there wasn't really time to talk trash um we didn't have social media even to like hype each other up on social media like it was just different like i don't know that's me maybe maybe i was the one that like kind of did my own thing and stood off to the side i didn't say much but like i said in the red zone when i would get guys like renato fitzpatrick and guys like trying to talk then maybe i would say something but i didn't say much i would catch a touchdown and then just kind of laugh and run back like i wasn't a big talker but yeah, I'm pretty sure Mike, Mike has speed, and, and speed uh, DBs, I struggled. So I know me and Mike probably just went back and forth a bunch. What do you remember, Mike? Yeah, I think, I think Ron's spot on. Like, I don't, I don't remember. Sorry, my light's turned off in my office. I don't remember, <laughs> um, you know, a, a lot of battles. I think that, um, you know, when it was one-on-ones or something like that, I, I would go against different folks for technique purposes. Uh, Ron was big, was physical, so on and so forth. Um, and so, you know, I, I'd go up against him, but you know, it was, it was more technique. Like we didn't, because we were both starting, we were both playing so on and so forth. We weren't going to sit there and roll, roll around on the ground. Cause that's not good, uh, for either one of us. Cause you know, coach Mason wanted us both out there on, uh, on Saturday to play. And then the other thing, like uh, Ron alluded to, like he played as a true freshman. I was still a running back as a true freshman. So he had a couple of years on me as well that, you know, we didn't even match up from a uh, offense defensive standpoint, but uh, I know that we definitely got each other better, more so from a mentally standpoint, uh, because we didn't sit there and, you know, we're not gonna jab them on the line or get too extra physical. So it was just a, a high level of uh, appreciation for the skill set. Sam, we're gonna have to get you doing some one-on-ones, like you against Harif Hassan. Like, I think 
I think we got to get some some media one on one. Arif would lock me down. I, I hear he's a beast with uh, the press coverage. Well, I want to thank Mike for joining me on the Ron Johnson show. Please go back and watch the Hangout with Ron Johnson segment. Remember, when you subscribe to Locked On Sports Minnesota, you're getting endless Vikings talk with local experts. Subscribe to the free Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast feed wherever you find your podcast, and find our videos on Locked On Sports Minnesota's YouTube channel. Thank you. Have a great day.